panelists. Thank you so much for joining us, Lee. Um, I, I am so appreciative that you've taken the time to, uh, to speak to us during this vigil. You know, I really appreciate you having me on. Thanks so much. I'm really honored. Uh, we can't see you right now. Uh, we just see um, a can twist. Um, can, uh, can you can you stop video or would you rather just speak this way? I totally got video. One second. Okay, not a problem. Uh, give me a sec to figure out which button I'm supposed to press here. Not a problem at all. It, there could there may be a, a start video on the bottom left next to <laughs> mute and unmute. Um, and don't, not a problem at all because I'm I'm completely tech phobic myself, and I and that's why it's totally ironic to be speaking about sure. such tech related subjects very often. Thank you. Yeah, we can see you now perfectly. Thank you so much. It's not really necessarily better seeing me, but you can now. So there you oh, go. It's much easier to have a conversation with somebody you can see than somebody you can't. I think. But uh, so you're you know you are a journalist. At, you, thank. Thank goodness we've t we've spoken to a number of journalists during this vigil who do speak out for Julian Assange. But um, why aren't more journalists on this bandwagon to protect press freedoms with the uh, with you know in the face of Julian Assange being silenced? Why are only a few uh, journalists speaking up about this? Yeah, it's really pretty staggering. I mean, there was a point where uh, supporting Julian was hip, <laughs> and journal and journalists were uh, happy to do it. But now he helped defeat Hillary Clinton. And I don't think that was the goal. Uh, he exposed the truth, right? I mean, he exposed Absolutely. emails and exposed things that, that people don't like. And if it had an effect on the election, I hope it did. Uh, but I don't, I, don't, I, I think you, you had a fundamentally bad candidate with Hillary Clinton, but not, not trying to personify her. Because I don't really care about people, like, like individuals. Cults of personality, much. yeah. Yeah, I care about the system a lot more. But Hillary Clinton is a pretty good representation of the system right now. I think that's really uh, accurate, yeah. Yeah, she she is, uh, I mean, if we're Jeb Bush, it's, it's, it would be the same thing. But somebody who's uh, benefited from the American political systems, system of oligarchy, uh, which is a unique little American exceptionalism spin on oligarchy, but uh, that's what it is. And she's done very, very well. She and Bill Clinton have done very, very well. And, uh, and really control the Democrat Party. And what Assange revealed was that the Democrats don't control the Democrat Party, which is that Bernie Sanders can have the biggest crowds, most enthusiasm, but literally the whole system is rigged against him, including, as the WikiLeaks uh, pointed out, the... Uh, the joint fundraising agreements and, and these other deals. And that really blew the lid off of everything. But but don't forget the other thing. He blew the lid off uh, Assange and everybody at WikiLeaks who, uh, you know, because you know, I, I think Julian would be the first to make sure the WikiLeaks team gets all the credit. But Julian's the guy holed up in the embassy right now. So let's not give him short shrift either. What they were able to do was they exposed a very close relationship between U.S. journalists and the political establishment as represented by Hillary Clinton. And I think that's why. I think that may be the unpardonable sin here is, uh, the, you know, the first rule of Fight Club is there is no Fight Club. And the first rule of journalism, you know, bias is we don't talk about journalism bias in, here in Washington. So... Absolutely. And I think it's really great to, to recognize not only that that, that that takes place and that revolving door that we've spoken about on the stream a lot, but also, as you said, that it, it doesn't it doesn't really um, ref it. The, the oligarchy that you're describing doesn't is not reflected in political parties, because, as you said, we have the Bush end of the dynasty that is on the Republican side. And then we have Hillary on the on the Clinton dynasty on the on the Democrat side. So it's this kind of. The, the reality behind that is it is a united front against the rest of us. And I've said this multiple times in the stream, but it, that's why it requires a united front. Uh, the whole reason we have this this stream is the unity that m is required to fight for Julian Assange and, and WikiLeaks moving forward. It's a united front in the sense that they they have gotten very good at the what, what I refer to on my radio show, Fault Lines. We talk about this. A lot, like you know, you had John Kiriakou. I watched uh, John on yesterday, 
He's also a host. I'm a host on Sputnik, uh, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, in the morning. And so we have a three-hour show. And we have just made sure we do as part of our morning newscast every day. It's, you know, 63 days since Julian Assange has been incommunicado and also how long it's been since the scripples have been incommunicado. And it's, it's, it's frightening. This is real. This is not a movie. It's not a book. This is right now. Julian Assange right now is incommunicado and it's over 60 days. And uh, like Cassandra Fairbanks said, it's getting normalized at this point. But John, John was on and he said that they talk about it all the time. We talk about on our show, like I say, every day a little bit. We try to focus on it every week, some. Uh, but I really appreciate the stuff you're doing. I really do, because you got to, because it's very, very easy just to give up and go home. And and uh, and there's a new episode of Westworld on tonight. And that's great, and you know, so it's like it's like it's easy to ignore this stuff, uh, but it's really, really important not to, especially for journalists. You talked about why aren't more journalists speaking up. That could be them. That could be them if they step out of line. So they've learned not to step out of line, right? They've learned not to report on certain things. I've done a a lot of White House press briefings. And, you know, when you're in that room, it's pretty amazing. uh, The lack of curiosity and just jerk. Everybody just wants to glom on to the last question the other person asked. But the reason I was going to mention Sputnik is you've had a few people, you you know, Kiriakou on and a lot of the people you've had on, we've had on as, as guests. And this that really sucks. And I will say this to someone who's on the Russian payroll as a host for Sputnik. But everybody who works at Sputnik or RT will say the same thing. They don't tell us what to say. There was no, nobody was like, hey, can you do the Assange thing? They don't care. They don't, they don't care. And that's why you see so many people from Sputnik and RT speaking out. Because the one thing I will say we don't have is pressure to shut up. Nobody's going to come in and fire me because I came up and supported Assange. That's the difference. With a lot of media outlets, and I've worked for media outlets on the left and the right. I've written for Mark Breitbart, I've written for Post, right? And there's a lot of pressure right now, and they're censoring a lot of material on both the left and right. And the second wave of media has been co-opted already. And that's why there's fewer and fewer people to speak out. So, Absolutely. And I think that uh, I think that a number of independent journalists have pointed out that part of the reason that they're that uh, journalists like yourself and John Kiriakou um, are on uh, Russian backed uh, networks is specifically because dissent has been um, stamped out in these legacy press outlets, whether on the left or the right, um, you know, whether it's the Wall Street Journal, or the New York Times, the dissent is not allowed to exist there. And so they're forced to the margins. It's a, it's a serious problem. I don't know if you have any more comments on that that you'd like to explain to the viewers. Well, it's, 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 it's very dangerous because the, as, as, a, as a tech person, right, I was talking to one of my kids the other day, and I realized I've been using computers for like 40 years. Like next year will be 40 years. I, I owned a Radio Shack TRS-80 Model 1 with 4K of memory. And uh, K, K, and uh, so I've been. I'm a I'm a tech person. I've been using tech for a long time, and of course, the dream of tech uh, was just what Julian's done. Really, is the is it shows the power of people, of individual people. He was able to do what the New York Times and the Washington Post were unwilling to do not unable to do, they're far more able to do it, right? I mean, I mean, everybody you've had on is scraping along for money. I just, right, everybody. Because there's, there's the money is in going along with, in, in, a, in America, I know the American narratives, but I know the American narrative, uh, the uh, narratives that up in Britain or whatever as well, in a few places, right? But in America, it's, it's Democrat, Republican, that's it. And, you can bicker about abortion or you can bicker about gun rights and that turns into uh, a Coke and Pepsi battle. In other words, if you just restrict the choices, if you just say to people, Hey, what's better Coke or Pepsi? Or we don't, as long as we don't mention water, for instance, which might exactly. be better, possibly free. 
and what wouldn't cause the diabetes that I have. Uh, but if you give people that Coke and Pepsi choice, that's where the money is. And in Democrat Republican politics, uh, I've seen it. I've seen it on the Democrat and Republican side. And the people talking about Assange now are the people who didn't make, didn't catch those checks. I don't know how else to put it. So on, on, an, on an issue like Israel-Palestine right now, it's people who can look at it. I might, I'd like I'd not to get off on a politics thing, but I'm one of those people who looks at it and goes, you're both being knuckleheads. What are you doing? This isn't going to possibly work. Cut it out. What are you thinking? You're not, you're never, you're not going to get rid of Israel exists. That's going to be a thing. And you should start treating the people, the Palestinians better. Cause what are you doing? Like that kind of political viewpoint, which I think actually most people share. Actually, I really do think most people would go, yeah, okay. Yeah. They're both kind of being idiots. Uh, that you can't hear. There's no, there's no, there's no market for that. And, and that's because as long as you can keep the, that fight going, there's a tremendous amount of money in it. And that's, again, that's the danger. And I think about how many things have happened in the 60 plus days Julian's been silenced from the Scripple situation to the situation that just happened with the ultimate fake news from Ukraine with uh, uh, Babchenko faking his own death with the leader of Ukraine, uh, the missile strike the Duma situation, all of these stories that have come out that we haven't heard Julian Assange from on. I mean, that's fr uh, Italy, oh, skip past that. Italy elects a coalition, can't seat a government, has to reform it, finally seats the government. This is big stuff going on. Even uh, what, what uh, I, I just think that what's happened in Armenia, think of all the stuff that Julian's missed. Uh, big, major, populist, and not in a partisan way. Left, right, doesn't make any difference. Big, major waves of post-technological populism, and Julian Assange has been silent on all of it, and it sucks. I was friends with Andrew Breitbart, and Andrew and I were close. And uh, after Andrew died, you'd sit there every day going, gee, I wonder what Andrew would say about this. I wonder what Andrew would say. The good thing is, hopefully we'll eventually know with Julian and we, he'll be able to speak out on issues. But right now, just to have that voice missing, that's exactly what they're afraid of. But I got to say, the other, can I say one other thing too? Oh, absolutely. Go right ahead. The, the other thing is, uh, and again, I don't want to, I don't want to say anything that would seem like I'm downgrading what Julian is going through personally, but in a very real sense, it's not about him. It's about you and me and everybody else watching, right? It's about you and me and everybody else watching. It's the thing that they tell you in prison, I've heard. I haven't really been in prison that much. But, you know, that, that go up and, like, punch the biggest guy, right? They say, find the biggest guy and go punch him. Why do they say that? Because it lets everybody else know you're not going to be messed with. Julian Assange was the biggest guy. Julian Assange is the biggest journalist in the world right now, period. He's the number one well-known groundbreaking journalist of our age. And if they, and that's why they're showing if they can do it to Julian, they can do it to you or me or anybody. They can do it to anybody. And uh, in the U.S., when these indictments are being issued to and fro and when Adam Schiff wants to subpoena me personally, which he does. Uh, it is frightening. It is, it, is, it is frightening. But I think, again, that's another reason people really need to speak up. And we had, and speaking of Adam Schiff, we had him recently basically admit that, there, that the U.S. does intend to prosecute and arrest Julian Assange. So that was a, a big development just in the last few days. But I, I really, I really uh, appreciate the point that you've made about the importance of Julian's voice specifically and uniquely in, in um, helping sort of awaken the public to all of the hypocrisy that happens across the sort of establishment and geopolitically, but but as well as the events that have happened since he's been silenced, as well as all the really big stories that you've mentioned, whether it was uh, the attacks on Syria, whether it was, you know, all of these events. I, it's not only those that Julian Assange comments on. What's so um, 
incredible about Julian Assange as well is he brings up issues that, you, that are completely out of left field from most people. For example, yeah. um, the, the, uh, the issue of Catalonian uh, self-determination. Um, and, and just just issues on that that line that most Americans would never have paid attention to if it wasn't for Julian Assange. So I just wanted to add that to that point you made because I think it's really uh, an important one to talk about for sure. Here's the, here's the other thing about Julian that's so frightening to people. If you think about it, the number one thing that he has uh, that he has is it's not a technical. Uh, advancement. It's not necessarily research skills. It's not, I can name a bunch of things. It's bravery. It's not money, right? There are journalists who have big organizations behind them, who have big, huge amounts of money, giant staffs, huge audiences that they can reach on a show like 60 Minutes or Infowars or whatever, right? There's lots of people who have a skill set. Julian's got one thing that's really frightening, which is he's the person who, when the documents got to him, he released them. Does that make sense? That's not tricky. But like that, that's not that part. There's a lot of other stuff that goes into it. I'm not knocking his technical ability or anything like that. But the main thing is he's the guy who, when someone gave him the documents, just knowing that it was going to make governments mad at him, he released them. Absolutely. And just let them speak for themselves. And you can't buy that, right? I mean, that's that's that ineffable, ineffable bravery thing. Just bravery. And again, that's what frightens him because the fact is uh, with some people, you can take them down. And if you take them down, they may not have replacement because there may not be another billionaire. There may not be another person who speaks nine languages or whatever. But if you take down the brave guy, if you take down Julian, they know that the people with the documents are just going to give them to somebody else who, if they're brave, will release them and put them up. But the idea of taking Julian down is to say to people, don't you do that. Don't, don't you do that. And we have that. I mean, the thing shift, the, the reason I'm under, he, he wants to subpoena him, but he can't. But it's because I dealt with Guccifer too. I was one of the reporters who dealt with Guccifer too, way after the hack happened. And uh, that kind of thing frightens them, because which is why there's been so much misreporting on that aspect of it. Uh, they know that Guccifer too is somebody who's get, who got documents and was giving them out to report it before it would be before WikiLeaks published stuff. Uh, material from that trotch information was coming out to other reporters. But again, you don't see those reporters from Gawk or whatever hold up in an embassy right now. So, Exactly. And that double standard uh, with the media also applies uh, in the sense of just the visceral hatred that's shown towards WikiLeaks and Julian Assange. But then when you look at some, an outlet like the Washington Post, who, yes, you know, broke the Watergate scandal, they get a movie made about them. They make they have a, a Hollywood movie with Tom Hanks that's, you know, portraying them as just this brave organization. So it goes to your statement about bravery, the real bravery that WikiLeaks and its staff, as well as Julian Assange, have shown um, that does not get uh, positively reported at all, of course, and doesn't get a Hollywood movie, um, a positive Hollywood movie made about it. Yeah, well, and, you, you know, Catherine Graham made a speech down the road. We're 20 minutes from Langley, where I am, where I live in Virginia here. And uh, she made a speech just down the road a few decades ago. And she said, the public doesn't need to know some of what we do. And this is this has been the attitude. And that's why that's why I say, even with WikiLeaks, if this is this is a matter of of principle at this point, because everybody, you know, one of the things that I like, I like best that I saw recently was Jack Posobiec interviewed Sarah Palin. And whatever people think of Sarah Palin, if Sarah Palin had gone up and said, you know, uh, Assange released material about me, screw that dude. Everybody would have understood. They may not have liked it, but they would have gone, you know. And what she said was to Jack, I've been a victim or whatever of Assange. I don't know if she used that term, 
But she said, then I started to realize, I got the importance of what he's doing and I support it. And I thought that was great. And I think we need more of that, of people who wouldn't or shouldn't be natural allies of Assange, just going, you know what? This, this is important and it's important beyond. And by the way, you know, I don't, you know, anybody who's out there is a Trump supporter who supported Assange for revealing that the, the, the Hillary stuff, you don't, you don't get it. Yeah, that's good. But I, I personally believe if he'd had the same stuff in the RNC, that would have come out as well. And if the RNC had been doing what the DNC had been doing, it would have gone over just as well with the Republican voters and, and, I, I, so it, it's, it is very, very, very disturbing right now that too many people have already been cowed into silence on this. Uh, and that, that's why I just hope you, I, I hope you keep doing these uh, because you, we can't right now. It, it just, it's so important not to let people forget. And there's so many things out to distract people that we either need to get Julian out or get Stormy Daniels in. Because maybe then, if we could somehow get Stormy Daniels into the Ecuadorian embassy, then maybe they could get some press coverage. I don't maybe. know. Maybe. That might, that might actually attract some news news outlets to, right. to the situation. Definitely. No, I, 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 we will absolutely, we are, and just to, to add to that statement, when you said that you, we hope, you hope that we keep doing this, we are absolutely going to keep doing a monthly yeah. uh, vigil every uh, first weekend of the month. So that will continue. And, and I've said this before, but I'll say it again. I really do hope that we don't have to do this too much, too many more times. I hope that Julian Assange is restored to his uh, ability to communicate as quickly as possible. But yeah, uh, yeah we will keep, keep doing this as long as we need to. Well, I, I'll tell you the other the other weird thing I've noticed in the news cycle lately is that this the trade war actually could be benefiting this. We'll see. I've said this for a few weeks now since the U.S. Here's another thing: the U.S. pulled out of the Iran deal. Since I'm just thinking of all the things we've missed Julian's voice on. That's another big one. So uh, since the U.S. pulled out of the Iran deal, I was saying immediately watch the trade war, it looks to me like Merkel, Johnson, and, and Macron all went to Washington and Donald Trump ignored them completely. And so the lovey-dovey relationship in the halcyon days when they're lobbing missiles into Syria, because that makes for a good, good relation. That's a meet cute for Merkel and Trump, where they can lob missiles in May and Trump. Uh, uh, that was all fine. Then a couple weeks later, boom. They're mad now with the trade war. The trade war actually could help Assange here in the sense that it, it, I, I think that you don't want too much unity between the Brits and the U.S. Let me put it like that. It's a little better when there's a little bit of dynamic tension, uh, shall we say, much like in Fleetwood Mac. When you get the Brits and the Americans together and they're fighting, that's where Fleetwood Mac would be a perfect example. Uh, uh, it's better, right? And so I, I think that that's actually good right now because apparently everything I'm hearing, most of the pressure on this is coming from the U.S. And you mentioned uh, as uh, bad in the Trump administration, Mike Pompeo is there's no nobody has been as bad on Assange as Mike Pompeo. So awful on it, and he's the Secretary of State. And if I remember correctly, I don't think he was Secretary of State when we last heard from Julian either. So. That's uh, that's another thing that's happened is Pompeo's been named. That was all Bolton, Bolton and Pompeo were both came in. Sixty days is a long time, right now. Absolutely, definitely, more than a long time. And I've said this before. I'm going to say it again for any viewers who haven't been, you know, keeping up with the entire stream. That uh, not only is it a long time, but it's actually quadruple the limit that you, the United Nations uh, decreed through the the Nelson Mandela rules that 50, over 15 days of solitary confinement is torture. So he has more than quadrupled that amount of time, which is absolutely insane and um, yeah. incredible. And I think that uh, I, I was wanting to get your perspective as well as a journalist and, I, and as somebody who's observing this from within the United States, because a lot of our panelists have been from other places around the world, but from within the US, um, you know, Trump, President Trump, um, no matter what end of this political spectrum you're on, 
um, it's just a, a, a fact that as president, he's one of the few people that actually could make a difference in Assange's situation. Um, that you know, we've seen petitions for Trump to part, pre, uh, preemptively pardon Assange. So, what do you think it's going to take to get Trump's base fired up about this enough that, or, or in any way, for the whole of the United States to uh, pressure Trump? What is going to, is it going to take to to get him to act uh, for Assange in a in a positive way? The president right now is surrounded by people, particularly in foreign policy, who in general were the opposite of what Trump ran on. Let me let me give a slight caveat just to be wonky enough on this. There was there were inherent problems in Trump's uh, goals of draining the swamp, his instinct towards wanting to cut Washington down combined with his conservative Republican instinct towards greater military spending. On one hand, he was a non-interventionist in areas like Iraq and Syria, and I think he, in Afghanistan, and I think he clearly, legitimately, like most Americans, sees that those entanglements have been bad. On the other hand, uh, Republicans like a strong military, and they like the idea of peace through strength and they tend not to see the contradiction there. You can't do both. You cannot have, you cannot drain the swamp. I live in the swamp. Uh, Lockheed Martin is right across the street from me. And what I tell people is, the thing about the swamp is it's fantastic. The shopping is great. There's great restaurants, uh, lots of clothing stores, great malls with mass transit right to them. And that is all paid for. That swamp, that lovely, lovely brunch mimosa drinking swamp, which is what it is. Great happy hours. Uh, that's paid for by the military industrial complex, you see. And so to, to put that out of business means some of those shops might close. Right. Or or and that that's that scares people. And so there's this contradiction of they build up the military spending, which is what the foreign policy is about very clearly, and you can't do it. So he's, he's, he's got a contradiction. The good thing is he's chaotic. And so if I see Nikki Haley and John Bolton and Mike Pompeo in there right now, and they frighten me and make me want to throw up, which they do, as a Trump supporter, they frighten me and make me want to throw up. I just go, we'll give it three months and let's see where we are then. You know, And he's rapidly running out of people. And the neocons are running through their bench. So if, if, if someone, you know, shot me six months into the future and their secretary of straight Rand Paul, let's say, do I think that's going to happen? No. Would I bet on it? No. Would I be so shocked? No, I wouldn't be shocked. I'd just go, oops, well, that, it's Trump. There, there you go. It just seems to me like you can have those sorts of swings. And so that's why I'm still I still remain hopeful because I know he doesn't like. I know he wants to take troops out of Syria, let's say, but every time it happens, there's a gas at, mysteriously. There's a gas attack, and uh, boy, Assad just really he just it, it seems like Bashar al-Assad almost is a, has a masochistic streak. Like just every time when Trump wants to pull out. He's like, oh, I'll gas my people. Perfect timing. Um, it's amazing the way that works. But uh, but it's he's chaotic enough where I think he could change. But what it's going to take is something happening that affects Trump directly that his people don't stop him from doing. So, for instance, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm making this up. Because I don't, I, I don't think WikiLeaks would do it, and I don't even think they should do it. But let's say Julian came out and said, we're going to reveal who did who was behind the email hacking. And it was Adam Schiff, right? And he could prove it, right? Mm -hmm. Then Trump would, like, I think then Trump would marry him. It's very possible he would move to the Ecuadorian embassy with Julian Assange. Uh, Something crazy like that, that, right, that would do it. Now, from that, anything proving that it's not Russia, or that there was no collusion might have an impact. 
but it might not. Trump is very weird on this stuff. And Assange is also not, not weird on it, but Julian Assange has been forced to be skittish on this, where if he came out and he thought the fairest interview he could get was with RT, which probably it would be, where they wouldn't cut it up or edit it or play a gotcha game. Absolutely. Definitely. I'm not sure he'd do it. Why? Because then everybody would go, oh, look, he just did it with RT. And so yes. you're forced to do this calculation of like, who will be taken seriously, but screw me the least. So if you <laughs> it's, a horrible, who, it's a horrible catch 22 for sure. But it's, but it's, but I'm right. Correct. I mean, that's what he, he'd have to do. You have to go like, okay, 60 minutes will be a huge platform. And maybe if I do it live or whatever, right. You know what I mean? Like you, you just have to have those calculations and uh, it's crazy, but, but we have good journalists at RT and Twitnik. We really do for the reasons that I said, which is no one tells us what to say. And, uh, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, if I were Julian, I wouldn't rush around. Do, I, Absolutely I not. I wouldn't do it. Yeah. But what, uh, as a journalist who's been following this story for, uh, you know, as long, as long as Julian Sanchez has been, has been gagged, especially you've been really um, reporting on this constantly, as you said, um, what, what is your perspective on what the uh, Ecuadorian government's next move might be? Because we've seen Moreno sort of, I mean, we've seen the Ecuadorian government sign a deal with the US military, but they've also come out and said that, as long as Assange doesn't uh, perform his job as a journalist and talk about politics, then the you know then the asylum will continue, or the asylum will continue, but he will be limited in his speech. So, with that kind of like um, sort of uh, oscillating back and forth, what do you see the Ecuadorian government um, doing in moving forward? Ecuador versus the United States is not a fair fight. Absolutely. So, there are only. There are very few countries, let's just be realistic here. Which countries could Assange go to that could withstand pressure from the United States? China and Russia. That's 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 possibly it. I could that could be it. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe a couple, you know. Maybe Iran. Well, there point. would always be the hope, and it's so it's such a sad statement as well on the on the West that he wouldn't be able to safely go back to his home country, Australia. Um, you know, that is such a sad statement that they have not that their government, and we've talked to guests who have, who have expressed that, that their government has not stood up for Julian Assange in any sort of proper way, just as a citizen of, of Australia. So it's too bad. See, I know enough about the relationship between New Zealand and Australia, having been down there once when the Tri-Nations was going on to know that what they should have done is played this so New Zealand takes them just to piss off Australia because they would do that. Australia doesn't care that much about New Zealand, but the New Ze if, if Assange was smart, he would have had the New Zealand embassy take him in just to give the finger to Australia. Well, take that, what are you gonna do? Work for Peter Jackson, something like that. That would work. But uh, no, I mean, it's, it's a bad situation. I don't know a Western country that could, that would take him, that would withstand pressure from the United States. So the strategy becomes, how do you get rid of the pressure from the United States? And then you could point out that a lot of people who hate uh, Assange most uh, are the opposite of what President Trump ran on foreign policy wise. But see, Mike Pompeo right now is on Trump's good side. So let's take that. Let's play that out. Mike Pompeo is the golden boy on North Korea right now. And it seems like, like Pompeo is ignoring Europe and just trying to fix Korea. If he does that, Trump is going to like that. And Trump is going to want to keep Pompeo around. And Pompeo on Iran, he's another Iran hawk, so he's fine on that. So how would you get Mike Pompeo to be on Julian Assange's side? I just don't see it. I don't see anything that could happen. I just, I'm, I mean, I, I, organ donation. I, 
I, I absolutely. It, it's sad that that's exactly uh, the, the the state of things. Uh, I, I'm aware that not only Trump, but I think Mike Pompeo as well, pr- uh, prior to Trump's election, actually had said some positive things about WikiLeaks. But obviously, since uh, as when Mike Pompeo was acting as CIA director, he made extremely, extremely, um, you know, disparaging remarks towards WikiLeaks, not just uh, as in, you know, uh, vitriolic, but I mean, as in comparing them to Al Qaeda and terrorist organizations. And that is such a damning um, comment on the state of the administration really towards towards Julian Assange after having praised him on the campaign trail. And so, yeah, I think that that is a really serious issue that Pompeo is now Secretary of State and, you know, possibly has even more uh, influence, if possible, on, on foreign policy for Trump. Well, the the problem in the American, so that's the problem in the American right. The problem in the American left right now is that the funding uh, of the NGOs, and Vanessa Bealey has talked quite a bit about this uh, from her perspective in the UK, traveling to Syria quite a bit, but I've I've noticed it too for years and years and years, is basically the American left has been completely co-opted. So I've talked about how Huffington Post has been sold out. Well, so is Amy Goodman and Democracy Now! And so is, and by the way, when I say sold out, I mean, that doesn't, do they ever do anything? Yes, they do. This is the way it works on the right and left. It's not like they never, it's not like they've completely turned against the base, right? So the people who supported Trump who were like, yeah, let's get out of Iraq, let's get out of Syria. They kind of accepted Nikki Haley or a, or a John Bolton, because they don't get that they're not like them. They don't understand that. They see the strength thing and they go, well, she seems tough. Well, she's horrible. Nikki Haley's awful. On the left, what they do is they they fund groups like the ACLU or Human Rights Watch or just put on the list, Amnesty, right? And, th- and that... Funding goes to a lot of things that people on the left, in fact, care about and may, in some cases, if they're reporting on Yemen or something like that, they're doing good work, right? So you see Amnesty and they do a report on Yemen, you go, well, that's good work. The problem is you could see this with the uh, with a strike on Syria. There's no organized anti-war left, period. I'll say that again. There is no organized anti-war left, period. It does not exist. It is much easier to get people to show up to something like a March for Our Lives, a Second Amendment issue, which, by the way, will never get resolved and only had the effect of raising huge amounts of money for not just the Democratic groups that were favoring gun control, but for the NRA. He raised, raised huge amounts of money for both of them, by the way, without taking a side on that issue. No, the absolutely. People, those run organizations for make, and you're and you're not going to get anywhere on it because the Second Amendment's in the U.S. Constitution and blah 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 blah. And they know that they know you're not really going to get anywhere on it. It's and that goes back to like, that. That goes back to that Coke, Coke and Pepsi issue. That's exactly that's right. exactly the way that it seems to a lot. And as you said, a lot of people see that. Uh, and and I, I think that the lack of the anti-war left that you're t- describing is a huge important factor in not only um, the co-opting of the left, but just in, in, in the inability to seem to raise support for WikiLeaks and Julian Assange, because be, uh, the result of the lack of an anti-war left, um, you know, it, it's as if the left fails some, some aspects of the establishment left, not, not the wonderful progressives that we've had on this stream, clearly. Um, it, it fails to support WikiLeaks and value what the work that WikiLeaks does as an anti-war, as sh- revealing the truth about war and revealing the actual yeah. corruption that leads to it. So I think that, that there's the follow-on from that. That vacuum it leads to a, a, a vacuum of support for WikiLeaks as well. So I think that's a massive issue. And again, that's not not to say that there aren't. Um, you know, I, I voted Bernie and Jill Stein, so I'm not disparaging the left uh, progressives, but the lack of that um, establishment left um, anti-war well, sense. But I think it's important for people on on their own side to realize how their side has been co-opted. Exactly. But that's the only way you end the co-opting. So the right has been co-opted by uh, APAC Israel funding, period. All the major right-wing secondary sites, Breitbart, uh, 
uh, Infowars is more is more independent. But even on Israel, even on Israel Gaza recently, Alex Jones went straight on on the side of Israel. No, no real nuance, just straight pro-Israel. It's the hardest thing on the right. If you come out and are like, well, I don't know, maybe the Palestinians aren't being treated that. I'm not against Israel, but maybe the Palestinians aren't being treated. What, you're pro-Hamas? And it's just like, boom. The left needs to realize where they've gotten co-opted is they'll go, well, I, but I like the ACLU or I like well, who I named the group. It doesn't make any difference. And the ACLU, well, they're doing good work on this issue. I know that's how they get the, that's why they take the funding. They're only told to shut their mouths on a few issues. They get, they can do whatever they want to most of the time. And most people, if you said, hey, look, I'll give you, I'll pay your bills, but just, you can't talk about these four things. It's like, but I can talk about these other 96? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay, I guess I'll do that. Well, unfortunately, these are the things, and there is a united, uh, there is a grassroots anti-war, nonpartisan, grassroots anti-war people don't like, people see what's going on in the Middle East, they don't like it. They don't, they don't love, people in this country don't love Saudi Arabia. They don't trust Iran, but they don't trust Saudi Arabia either, and uh, for good, for good re- for reasons that are rational. Not I'm not talking about racism or anything like that. They they're poorly educated. Most Americans couldn't tell you the difference between Sunni and Shia. They couldn't tell you the difference between Salafi and Sufi. They have no distinction on that. And that's exactly how the media wants you. They want you dumb. They don't want you knowing any difference. Uh, and then all what you end up with is the left going, oh well, you know, sections of the left going, no, no, no. Don't be Islamophobic. All Islam's the same. And the right going, oh, no, no, all Islam's the same and they're all awful. And then they miss the fact that every major terrorist group from Al-Shabaab to Boko Haram to Al-Qaeda to ISIS, they're all Salafi. They're all Sunni Salafi groups who were funded by Saudi Arabia. They, that, misses, that distinction is lost on a lot of people. And it's not tricky. It's not hard. And that's not to say we should go to war with the Salafis. It's just that's the facts. And so when the Coke and Pepsi propaganda thing is so strong, people see the other trick is people in America and and Europe, people across the West, they're used to propaganda having a certain look. Right. Which is it's it's one. It's North Korea. It's welcome to state TV one. Most glorious leader Kim Jong Un today said, and that's what they're used to. There and they they turn on the TV and they go, "I got a hundred channels. I got YouTube. I got Twitter. How is this propaganda? It's not even possible because look at all the choices I have." And they don't realize the choices that get cut out. They don't understand how the news picks narratives and focuses on Stormy Daniels and ignores Julian, for instance. But here's what it is: if the networks every day were like. It's day 63 for Julian Assange. You can bet if every day in the White House, people were asking, what's going on with Julian Assange? Whatever, blah, blah, blah. It would change overnight. Now, that's never going to happen. The media is, they live off of access, and they don't want to piss anybody off in in this town. Uh, I've avoided that since I worked for Russia. Um, uh, But uh, I don't get invited to the parties. So... Uh, but if you if you're looking for the media change, it's not going to change. So the only thing that can happen is people need to start showing up in numbers. And if if it keeps happening, and if it keeps happening, it's going to get traction at some point because people haven't let it go. And if it just gets a little bit bigger, but people need to realize that there is no organization. There's no move on is not going to come in and spend $3 million on this, or I'm not, I'm just picking a move on because I used to work for them. Uh, but uh, just anybody name, name the organization center for American. Pro- Good luck. Center for American <laughs> progress is not, 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 
not this century, definitely not. But I think yeah. it's a brilliant, brilliant point you make about uh, the role of uh, the the efforts by the media to keep the population uninformed, because that is the absolute inverse of what WikiLeaks does, which is purely to inform the population, uh, the public, with accurate information. So it's a very, very clear, stark uh, black and white image in that sense. And I think um, it, what you were saying reminded me of uh, what Julian Assange had had. Uh, the the phrase he used on his when he initially created his Twitter account he on his bio section he had a he described himself as picking the lock to the chain of, that it enslaves mankind ignorance and I think that the point you were making about the media trying to keep us ignorant goes directly to that so I think that's a really important aspect of this to talk about well I, you know I've talked before I'll tell you I'll tell you one other thing since I know we're almost out of the hour but um and again, thanks for having me on. I'll tell you one other thing as a research-based journalist that a lot of people who aren't research-based journalists don't fully appreciate about the enormity of the work that WikiLeaks and, and, and Julian Assange have done. Usually as a researcher, the truth eventually comes out. What I, what I mean by that is as history is going on, let's say there's a war in 1776, right? Eventually, someone finds George Washington's personal diary, let's say, right? And then that ends up being published and historians go through it and it gives them a different perspective. We knew there was a battle, right? We knew they crossed the river here or whatever. We didn't know what Washington was thinking or that he was thinking of attacking the night before or whatever. So what WikiLeaks has done is fascinating. They've given... Uh, journalists and regular people a look at the back historical record almost in real time. So what we're able to do before the election was look at, and frankly, I wish we had it for the Republicans, I'll be honest, because I'm just in favor of transparency. So I think that's, that's exactly the attitude that we have here. But yeah, continue, please continue. But you were able to look at the record almost in real time. And that's significant because you can still ask people about it. You can still say, well, when you said this, what were you referring to? And sometimes when people are dead, if, it's, if the record doesn't come out for 100 years. And we've hit, again, to use a, a sort of tech term, uh, the, this, the iterations of history we're able to go through so much faster now, where it used to be something would happen, we'd figure it out a thousand years later, or right? Now, it's almost in real time. And uh, when I used to do, I was doing digital video in the late 80s, early 90s, because like I said, I'm a long time computer person. And we used, this is, this is when there were still like six, you know, cable had 12 channels, right? And we were predicting the future at this digital video company I was working on. And somebody asked us, they said, well, do you think TV will be better or worse in the future? And we said, it'll, there'll just be more of it. Don't, don't ask yourself better or worse. It's just more. And that means there'll be more worse, but there'll be more better too, just more. And so what WikiLeaks has done, the other big revolution is it's not held behind lock and key at some place where you have to get a researcher's card. It's available to everybody. And that means that there's more crappy analysis, right? So in other words, WikiLeaks releasing the material led to absolutely more crappy analysis and people seeing stuff in emails that weren't there and that they couldn't prove and everything else. I don't care because that's what I said more because it also led to more good analysis. Now, sometimes the bad analysis sort of, uh, it's more noticeable than the good analysis, but this is, this is why I told that story about the future of TV and, and we're at the future of journalism now. And why, like I say, it doesn't make any difference because other people will do it. And this is, why they, this is why governments, big organizations, NGOs are scared to flip in death because they know that when this keeps happening, it will cause more and more people to realize that these big institutions are in fact as untrustworthy as we've suspected that they were. And now that it's happening in real time, are actually accountable for it. And so uh, legacy media is scared to death death right now. But I think that, that the, 
the, the, the best thing WikiLeaks has done is be just neutral. Here's the information. And then it's not, it's not WikiLeaks job at that point. It's no, it's, 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 it's journalists job to go, you know what, that theory you pulled out of the email seems bogus for this reason. But as a researcher, I can't tell you what an absolutely invaluable resource it is to be able to go back and assemble a timeline of what was being said privately and overlay that on another layer of what we already knew publicly and go, gee, they knew this three days early and everything like that. And that's, that again, that's the genie. They get, uh, and again, you don't like to say this, but it's just true. Whatever happens to Julian, whatever happens to WikiLeaks, the, the the genie's out of the bottle here, you know, so. Wait, I suddenly can't hear you. I, I forgot to unmute myself, which is totally typical of me. Uh, but I appreciate so much all of uh, your time on this and your thoughts on it. It's been great to have you participate in this vigil. And uh, I, I, it's really great to see so many journalists participating in this, even though there should be many more, as we've said a number of times. It's, it's just great that you all are taking the time out to, to, to really stick your neck out for somebody who is a political prisoner. So I know I appreciate it. I know that the audience appreciates it. And um, thank you so much for speaking with us. No, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks. And uh, uh, do you want to let the viewers know um, where they can find you on social media as well? I mean, uh, I know you, uh, for those, yeah, tell them about uh, fault lines and, and just about where they can find you. Sure, yeah, sure. The best, uh, the best, the best way to reach me is at Stranahan on Twitter. That goes to everything else. We have uh, fault lines in my radio show that gets rebroadcast there. Then we have Citizen Journalism School, citizenjournalismschool.com. We have a blog, free newsletter, and stuff like that over there as well. And, uh, and we, we teach how to do journalism where you get facts right. And we talk about going through the WikiLeaks and stuff, so. That's fantastic. Absolutely amazing. So thank you so much, Lee, for coming on. And well, I'm, I'm sure that in the future when uh, we have more vigils like this in the coming months, if they're required, that I'm sure we'll see you again. And thank you for coming on today.